Right, uh, okay, my name is Andrew, Andy Price and uh, I'm on the GFS2 file system team at Red Hat. And I'm going to tell you about uh, a small, file, uh, small language I've been developing uh, to make it easier for us to uh, write tests for GFS2 and GFS2 utils. It's uh, just a small language specific to the on-disk uh, uh, format of GFS2. Um, so uh, it, it knows about the, the file system through libgfs2. Um, it's uh, very much a work in progress and I want to share it with you at this point in development so that I can get some feedback and uh, maybe spark some discussion about the whole approach to writing tests uh, and, and uh, about the whole uh, language itself. Uh, so it's been developed alongside the, the, the new test suite in GFS2 utils, which uh, has only just been created. Uh, there aren't many tests in it so far, uh, uh, but we've been developing this language uh, as and when we've needed it uh, to uh, create new tests. Uh, so you don't need any prior GFS2 knowledge for this uh, talk. You might have uh, caught Steve's talk earlier, uh, and you might know a bit about GFS2 already, uh, but for this talk, don't need to know anything uh, about that really. Uh, a bit, word of warning, there are some destructive examples in this talk. Uh, the whole point of the language is to be able to break a file system in a focused way so that we can uh, run tool tests uh, to check that FSCK uh, fixes some kind of uh, corruption scenario with the, uh, the file system. Uh, so if you're going to uh, run the examples in, the, in these slides, then please don't use it on a production system. To go without saying, really. Uh, so, just a, a, a bit of a recap over uh, some of the GFS2 basics. Uh, so, it's uh, it's a block-based file system, and each of its blocks can be thought of as having a type. So, for example, you have the super block, which is a block on the file system which is empty apart from the metadata header at the top, um, and that's a, uh, a GFS2 SB uh, type uh, block. And also we have uh, resource group header blocks, which come before uh, each of the resource groups in the file system. Uh, and uh, they contain, uh, at the beginning, they have a metadata header, like in the super block, but they also, con also contain uh, allocation bitmaps to, uh, uh, for the, the resource group uh, blocks. So uh, some of the metadata in GFS2 file systems is contained in a separate tree, uh, a metadata tree uh, that we call GFS2 meta. Um, that's the user should never really uh, encounter that at all in, in, in uh, normal usage. Uh, that's just for the, uh, the tools to use themselves when, when they're making uh, changes to the file system. Um, so that contains things like uh, journal data and quota data and other per node stuff. Um, and just like other file systems, GFS2 utils has uh, 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 GFS2 has uh, user space tools in the GFS2 utils package, so uh, FSCK and uh, MakeFS and things like that. Uh, okay, so what are we trying to achieve with this language? Well, file system, file system corruption is a fact of life. Uh, you know, it can come about by uh, uh, power outages and faulty hardware and uh, sunspots, whatever. And uh, so much of this you can fix with uh, FSCK uh, as long as it has enough context to rebuild the, the file system metadata and get it back into a consistent state. But uh, FSCK can also have bugs, obviously. Um, so uh, you need a good test coverage of FSCK.GFS2 in order to uh, be confident that it can uh, fix all of the corruption scenarios that you expect it to. Uh, it doesn't have to fix every single uh, corruption scenario, so if you uh, write over your super block and a couple of uh, resource group headers or something like that, then it's very difficult to, uh, to rebuild the, uh, the metadata from that. Uh, so you need good, good test coverage in fsck.gfs2. Uh, okay, so uh, one problem we have is that when a user uh, encounters some file system corruption, it's very difficult for them to communicate the nature of that file system corruption uh, to us uh, from human to human so that we can understand the nature of that uh, corruption ourselves and uh, so that we can uh, try to fix it and understand it and uh, um, inspect it. 
So uh, the, uh, the uh, conditions are difficult to replicate on our side. Um, and so it's tricky to test that uh, FSCK actually fixes all of these uh, scenarios. Um, so to date, uh, we've used metadata dumps to gather uh, information about uh, file system corruption from users. Uh, a metadata dump is basically a, cor a compressed file uh, which contains all of the uh, metadata from uh, a GFS2 file system. And uh, it's, uh, so the, um, it doesn't contain any uh, uh, user data, just the, just the metadata of the file system. And uh, the user can uh, dump that to disk and uh, with GFS2 edit, save meta, and send us the metadata dump. And uh, uh, we can restore it onto our test systems with uh, GFS2 edit, restore meta, and run our tests on it, and inspect it to see what the, uh, the corruption is and uh, why, why our tools didn't fix it and uh, produce tests from it and things like that. Uh, so these metadata dumps can be pretty big, uh, depending on the, the user's uh, file system. It can go into gigabytes, terabytes, uh, so it takes a long time to download these things from uh, the users. And uh, also we need a lot of storage space to keep a repository of these uh, 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 metadata dumps uh, for future testing. So if we wanted to produce a regression test to check that FSCK uh, fixes the uh, corruption, and also after making changes to FSCK that it still fixes the corruption, uh, we have to um, keep the, that metadata around. And also they cons consist of mainly clean blocks, so uh, the metadata might only be uh, corrupted in, in one particular point. And uh, uh, so uh, when we run FSCK over it, for example, it would have to grind through all of the clean blocks before it gets to the, uh, the point of corruption, uh, which then exercises the uh, code path that we want to test. So that can be slow and uh, it's not very focused. So how do we inject uh, breakage into a clean uh, file system in, in order to test that we can fix that breakage? Well, one, uh, one option is by using DD. Uh, that's a bit heavy handed and uh, it's like uh, using a sledgehammer really. Uh, when, you, when you write these uh, commands, uh, you have to use uh, magic numbers for the, you know, the seek offsets and uh, the write sizes so that you can write over the uh, individual fields in, a, in the file system. And it's hard to know what those uh, uh, offsets and write sizes actually refer to uh, when you're reading them back. So it's uh, uh, totally unreadable and you have to comment it and uh, it's long-winded. So GFS2 is a little bit better in that regard uh, because it, you can uh, use uh, uh, symbols to refer to like the, uh, the super block and the resource index and things like that. Uh, so it's a bit more readable. Um, GFS2 edit itself is a, it's a very useful tool. It's based on hex edit and it has uh, an NCUS user interface so that you can page through every block in the file system um, and uh, it, it'll let you uh, change the fields on a byte per byte uh, basis, uh, just at the click of a button. And you can also use it in a command line mode, so you can uh, tell it to change a field in a, in a script. But it has a quirky interface. It's not anything you're familiar with, like uh, the usual get opt kind of uh, user interfaces. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of evolved over time uh, to, the, uh, to grow all of these features that we've needed uh, on the test-by-test uh, -test basis. And uh, so the, the code is hard to extend. Uh, and it only lets you uh, change one uh, field per uh, invocation of the GFS2 edit command. Uh, but it's still much better than DD. Right. So come down to the solutions. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Steve added this uh, meta.c file to libgfs2, which contains some uh, static arrays of structures which describe the actual data types that we use in a gfs2 file system. So essentially it's a description of all of the, uh, the, the data types inside user include Linux gfs2 on disk.h. Um, so that allows you to read an arbitrary uh, file system block um, 
and look at its type and then uh, cross-reference that with the metadata description and that will give you a structure with all of the, the field types and the, uh, the, uh, the sizes and their offsets within the, the data type. Uh, so that kind of allows you to, to use the, the block as you would an object in a, in a dynamic language. <coughs> okay, so we get to the language. It's called uh, GFS2L. That was always a, a working name. That was just the name of the, the, the binary that it produced uh, when, uh, when it was compiled. Uh, it's uh, an interpreted language. Uh, it's similar in style to a query language. Uh, essentially, it has uh, get actions and set actions. Um, so it's pretty simple at the moment. There is some overlap in functionality with GFS2Edit. They both allow you to uh, modify fields and uh, and print print fields uh, from the file system. But uh, I don't expect it to actually uh, obsolete GFS2Edit anytime soon because they both have their different uh, uh, purposes. And it's been de designed for, for use in testing from the outset, so it's uh, a lot more uh, useful uh, for when we're writing tests. So I never really had a, wrote a specification for the language. Uh, it kind of uh, grew organically. Uh, so uh, a script in this language is a series of statements and each statement has an action clause, a lookup clause, and a data spec clause. Um, and that's pretty much it, really. That's the language. Um, and it borrows some syntax from C uh, because all of the uh, Jeffers 2 team are C programmers. So uh, we, we can be uh, quite comfortable with it. Uh, so it has uh, the data spec clauses are all, uh, is the same syntax as uh, 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 structure literal in, in C. And also the uh, the statements can be separated by uh, some semicolons. And uh, hash is a line comment in in the language, so you can uh, write scripts, executable scripts with it, with a hash bang line at the top. Um, if you want to do that sort of thing, um, and it's command line friendly. It has uh, it reads from standard in by default, so you can uh, so you can pipe scripts into it, and it will. Uh, and, and uh, write scripts with it, and it also has some um, uh, some uh, interesting uh, options like uh, minus t, which will give you the list of uh, the data structures that it understands, and also uh, minus f, which uh, allows you to inspect all the fields and their offsets within a certain kind of data structure. <coughs> so. Uh, uh, one side effect of the way that the language actually parsed uh, allows you to um, specify uh, number values in, as hexadecimal or in base 10. So sometimes you want a value to be in hexadecimal because it represents an offset or an address and it makes more sense to represent it in hex or uh, you, know, you can use base 10 for sizes and things like that and counts. So the implementation is Pretty simple. It's just a, a flex lexer attached to a Bison parser, and uh, they allow you to do some basic error reporting. So it uh, tracks which line of the file it's on and uh, which which column it got to, so it can uh, report uh, syntax errors for you. Um, and the way it works is uh, it builds a, a syntax tree from the uh, from a script which is uh, a tree which stores all of the, uh, the statements down the left-hand side and it goes into the statements on the right-hand side. And uh, then after it's built the syntax tree, it, uh, it, runs, uh, it runs through it, tra uh, traverses it, and uh, interprets it. So there's no uh, fancy stuff like optimization or transactions in it at the moment. So, but uh, it would be really easy to actually add those to the language uh, if the uh, if it turns out that they would be useful. But we haven't really used this language enough yet to uh, to really know whether those kind of things would be useful to us. So the kind of optimizations I'm talking about would be say if. Uh, if you had two modif modifications of the same field in a, in a, in a block uh, without uh, uh, without a read uh, between them, 
then you might as well just throw away the first modification and just keep the, the first one, uh, the second one, sorry. So here we get to the language. As you can see, it's really simple. Uh, the first example just shows uh, the basic form of a get statement. Um, it, uh, it, it will look up uh, file system block one, two, three, four. So it'll, it'll look up the, uh, the block size from the super block, and then it'll uh, use that to find the well, block one, two, three, four in the file system. And then it'll, uh, it'll sniff the, the type of that block, if it has one, uh, cross-reference it with the metadata description that I, I mentioned before, and then print all of the fields in, a, in, a, in an easy to, uh, easy to read and easy to pass format. Uh, <coughs> So the, the second example shows an alias. Uh, some, there are some hard-coded uh, hard aliases in the language, uh, like SB, which is an alias for the, uh, the block number of the super block. Uh, so that would just translate the, the alias to, to the, the address uh, and, uh, and processes it as in the first example. Uh, the third one shows an offset. Uh, so R index is just uh, another alias to uh, another uh, block number in the file system. Uh, but you also add an offset of 0xaf, which is 175. So it will read the block number of the R index and then add 175, use that as the address, and then look it up as before. <coughs> uh, the fourth example shows how we would reference uh, the uh, resource group header blocks. Um, that would uh, 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 by by index, and that one would just uh, look up the first uh, resource group. Uh, the last example shows uh, how we can specify a path to refer to uh, uh, an inode. So it would resolve the uh, the inode block of a file called foobar, um, and then uh, take that block number and and uh, look it up as before. Uh, it's probably worth noting that this is obviously not a mounted file system. This is all done through user space, through libgfs2, and uh, through uh, the language interpreter. Okay, so uh, modifying, uh, here are some examples of modifying uh, fields with the language uh, compared to uh, how you do it with DD and gfs2 edit. So with DD, um, you would have to Right, uh, you have to uh, yeah, right, read from dev0, write, write it to the uh, device at a certain offset uh, with a, a certain write size, and you would have to work all of that out uh, uh, from, from scratch, uh, depending on what field you wanted to, to overwrite in, uh, in whichever block you wanted. So that's totally unreadable. It's hard to write, and uh, I just try to avoid it. Uh, with GFS2 edit, it's a little bit better. Um, it, the, the, the fields have symbolic names, so that you can refer to them as things like uh, SB and SBB size. Um, so that's a bit more readable, but uh, this is one of GFS2 edit's quirks. You use the minus P option to modify uh, a field where uh, minus P is meant to be the print option. Uh, but uh, that option was uh, it was changed over time to uh, implement some field changing uh, functionality, uh, and with uh, GFS2L, it's a lot better. You can just set SB SB uh, B size zero, and that's a script in GFS2L that would do the same thing. It's a lot more readable and. Uh, a lot more concise. So white space isn't significant in the language, so you can uh, format your code just as you would with C. Um, you can uh, make your, uh, your data spec uh, clauses uh, easy to read, uh, just like in that example. In that, in that example, you would uh, set the die A time, die blocks, and die entries fields of the inode structure in uh, referring to uh, the foobar uh, file. Uh, so 
So how would we integrate this into our tests? Well, this is one example. You would create a, a new file system with MakerFS. Uh, that gives you a clean file system, obviously. And then you would uh, use GFS2L to uh, uh, run a script. And that would uh, inject some kind of corruption into the file system. And then once that's done, you run uh, FSCK over it with the, the minus Y option to make sure it fixes all of the uh, all of the corruption that it encounters. And then uh, once that exits, if it exits with uh, if it doesn't exit with the right return code, then you know it hasn't fixed uh, the corruption that you injected into it, and then you can fail an exit. Uh, and then. Uh, but if it succeeds, if you uh, run FSCK again with the, the no option uh, to, to test whether there is still corruption in the file system, then you know that uh, the previous FSCK didn't do its job and you can fail and exit again. But also, you, uh, if you uh, put all this into a script, into a bash script, and replace the name of the uh, GFS2L script uh, with a, uh, say, a bash variable, then you could loop through a bunch of scripts in a directory and run those with uh, GFS2L and uh, test FSCK against a bunch of different kind of uh, corruption scenarios in a batch. Okay. So here's some uh, examples of command line usage. You can uh, easily incorporate uh, GFS2L into a pipeline, you can just echo uh, a script into it, uh, like that one. Um, and you can use the, uh, the, the minus T option, as I mentioned before, to print all of the data types at your disposal. And then you can use minus F to uh, print all of the, the fields in that data type with their offsets. And that would be good for tab completion scripts for example. It's okay, so where do I want to take this? Well, there are lots of ways we could take this. Uh, what I would really like is a way to translate a corrupt files or some file system corruption directly into uh, a script written in this language. So one way to do that would be to extend FSCK to uh, recognize some corruption uh, in, in the files, well, it already does that, but, uh, but to translate the, files, the corruption that it encounters into the, the language, um, and then we could take, take that auto automatically generated script and put that in, into our uh, test cases. Um, one blatant omission of the, the language so far is the ability to modify the contents of blocks. So, uh, for example, in a, in a resource group header block, you have the, the allocation bitmaps, but we can't actually change that with the language yet. And I've yet to uh, think of a, a nice clean syntax for, for actually doing that. But uh, if you have any suggestions, then please let me know. Um, and the same situation with directory entries in, in, in uh, directory, uh, directory blocks. Um, it will be easy to add transactions, so uh, it's probably not necessary because we only have a small script so far. But uh, it would be easy to add them just by uh, creating a separate uh, syntax tree for each transaction and running them in turn, so that uh, if the first transaction uh, failed, then all of those, all of the uh, statements in that transaction would fail, but the next transaction could carry on. Um, I would like better error reporting. Uh, Bison gives you the option of uh, adding uh, error conditions into your grammar so that uh, if it was, say, ex expecting a certain symbol and it didn't find it, then it would uh, call a handler, which you can use to uh, uh, tell the user that it was expecting the symbol and perhaps they meant this instead of that, like all good compilers do. Uh, and also, I'd like to improve the documentation. And uh, one fun toy project would be to, uh, once this language is, is matured to the point that I think it could mature to, then you could probably in implement uh, makefs.gfs2 in, in it, and perhaps some of the other tools as well. 
but uh, that obviously wouldn't be very useful for us. That would just be a, uh, something fun to have a go at. But uh, that's the kind of power I think we could get out of a language like this. Okay, so uh, something I, I didn't put into the into the slides uh, was uh, the question of why we didn't uh, bind uh, a, an existing language like Python or JavaScript or Lua into this. Um, and the answer is that uh, once you've actually written the interpretation layer where the, uh, the AST is interpreted into uh, the, uh, the cross-references with the metadata description, then you've pretty much done all the work that you need to. And adding a small language like this on top of it is, is pretty um, simple. So you don't need all of the the standard library stuff and the uh, the garbage collection and uh, the other kind of uh, or even Turing completeness completeness that uh, uh, a scripting language would give you. But uh, yeah, if you want to play with this language, then uh, clone our, our uh, GFS2 utils git tree and go through the um, the build process uh, documented there, and it'll uh, produce uh, GFS2L in the libgfs2 directory. And you might also want to take a look in, our, in the test directory to see if uh, you can uh, see what tests already exist. There aren't many at the moment, but uh, I'm very, very much welcoming uh, submissions of new tests. Um, and uh, if you want to get in touch, then uh, Cluster Devel is the mailing list that we use for uh, development and announcements and uh, patch submissions and things like that. Um, so if anybody has any questions or suggestions or criticisms of the language or the approach to uh, writing tests, then I uh, would very much like to hear them. How difficult would it be to, to make this run on another file system? Or how, how well is it entrenched to the, the GFS to file system? That's actually a very good question, and that's something I I, uh, I wanted to, to mention, uh, but I didn't. Um, they, uh, I would like to explore that. I think with the right uh, support from other file systems, all, all you would really need is a way to plug in a different metadata description into the language. So as long as they uh, supported the idea of looking up uh, an arbitrary block on the disk and each there was a way to find out which uh, type that, that block was then you could cross reference it against the right metadata description and you could do it for other file system types like that so it's possible but it would need to, some, some kind of support in that way any other questions Yeah, I, th I think it could. Uh, and also, perhaps, uh, if there were, like, let's say there was a, a support guy uh, out on site at a customer, and uh, they, they, were, uh, they were experiencing some kind of corruption situation, and they, they sent, uh, uh, and, you know, FSCK develop, uh, actually dumped one of these scripts, and, sent, and they sent the script back to us to show us what the corruption was. Then we could uh, produce another script, which was kind of the reverse of that, and we could send that back to the support guy who's on site, and he could run that script, and that would fix their their file system uh, uh, with, without uh, you know transferring these big files back and forth. Uh, but obviously, that would all have to be uh, tested and uh, uh, done with very controlled. Uh, pardon? No, no. Not where uh, customer data is concerned. <laughs> Any other thoughts? All right. Thank you very much.